The this house, conference will now be recorded. Housing needs experiences from the BC Approach webinar with the New Brunswick Association of Planners. My name is Susan Dean and I'm on the Association's Continuous Professional Development or CPL subcommittee and our team is thrilled to have you here with us today. Um, we had over 100 individuals register for the session and people are from everywhere ranging from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and PEI all the way out to Ontario and BC. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to kick it off with some housekeeping points. So this session will be recorded and it will be shared along with the slides from, from the presentation on the API website. So those should be up within the next week or so. Um, because we have an hour uh, in the interest of time, we'll address questions at the end of the presentation during a question and answer period. So that being said, please feel free to post your questions in the comments box at any time. And you'll see that word bubble in the top right corner. Go ahead and click that and you'll have access to, to the comments section. And at the, at the end of the presentation, I'll open that up and, and pass as many questions as possible along to our presenters. Um, and uh, if there are questions that we can't address today, um, contact information will be provided for our presenters so you can follow up. Um, again, we're gonna keep everyone's mics on mute. Uh, we're often working from home, so I know there'll be dogs barking and maybe kids coming up with questions. And it's nice to have that human side, but um, just so we can hear our presenters, we'll, we'll be keeping things on mute and using the comments box. Um, and last point, for registered professional planners, this session provides one CPL learning unit. So um, you will see this session in the drop down box on the Canadian Institute of Planners CPL webpage. So that's our housekeeping points. Um, as a bit of background on today's webinar, uh, in 2019, British Columbia enacted a provincial requirement and framework for analyzing and reporting on housing needs at the local level. Um, over the past year, planners at Halifax based Turner Drake and Partners Limited have been working with partners in BC to complete several of these needs assessments. So to move on to presenting our presenters, we've got Neil Levitt, Andrew Scanlon Dickey, and Sandy Mackey. So Neil and Andrew are both professional planners with Halifax-based Turner Drake and Partners. It's a multidisciplinary real estate consulting firm. Their planning work focuses on issues where community planning overlaps with real estate market dynamics and land development economics. So all the way from BC, we have Sandy. Um, he's a professional planner and housing research and policy lead at McCola Development Services. It's an indigenous owned consulting firm that grew out of the activities of the McCola Group of Societies. And um, this group is one of the largest nonprofit housing operators and developers in British Columbia. And Sandy's work focuses on strategic planning and policy projects related to housing. So a very a big good morning to you, Sandy, at 6 a.m. So um, all, Neil, Andrew, and Sandy are all graduates of the Dalhousie School of Planning. And with that, I will hand it over to Neil to kick things off. Thank you for all for being here. Great. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Susan. And also a big thank you to everyone attending. I see a, a lot of uh, familiar names, which is great, and a lot of unfamiliar names, which is also great. And yeah, it's great to hear that we potentially have other people joining us from as far as uh, the West Coast. So a very good morning to you as well. Um, I guess we'll just get right into it. So not to rehash what Susan just went through, but uh, today the folks speaking to you is myself, uh, Neil and my colleague Andrew here at Turner Drake. And we're also very thankful and happy that Sandy could join us as well. Um, I kind of I invited Sandy to uh, to help us present this as a bit of a professional courtesy because we've been working so closely on this, not really expecting him to want to get up at you know 5:30 in the morning and and uh, do this, but he was more than willing as he always is. So I should have known, and uh, I'm very excited that he's here to speak to his work in this because uh, both the on the ground and the public engagement side of housing needs assessments is so critical, and and Sandy is very good at it and and speaking to the power of that. So. I'm happy that he's uh, here to join us this morning. Uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to go through. So I'll start out with just a fairly uh, brief overview of what housing needs assessments are. Likely a lot of you have maybe uh, done one or reviewed one recently, but in, just in case you're coming in completely blind, we'll go through what they are and why we think they're important. Uh, we'll jump into specifically the, the British Columbia context, and this is Kind of the, the point of this presentation originally we were intending to do it as part of the uh, as a pr uh, conference presentation for the api conference back in the before times 
Um, and at that point, we were just kind of wrapping up our first one of these, one of the first ones to go through this new framework. And uh, at this point now, because it's taken some time to readjust and, and find an alternate platform, we're actually just wrapping up uh, our fourth one in the coming months. So we can talk about how BC structures this type of work, because it's not only done in BC, obviously, uh, and some of the advantages and disadvantages of that, um, the key findings, the interesting stuff that's come out of our work in BC, and how uh, the lessons learned that from the last almost two years at this point, year and a half that we've been doing this in the BC context, how that can maybe improve how things are done in BC and certainly uh, what it informs us about similar work here in Atlantic Canada, some of the similarities, some of the ways that, that we could take those lessons learned and adapt them. So to kick it off, housing needs assessments. Really, at its most simple, uh, housing needs assessments are just reports that identify existing and anticipated housing conditions. Um, so housing is a, a subject, a topic that really tends to overlap or capture a lot of other uh, dynamics, a lot of other factors that are going on in your community. So to say it's just identifying existing and anticipated housing conditions, really baked into that is a study of a lot of different uh, uh, information about the communities that we're studying. So we look at both a lot of quantitative data about you know, the, the economy, demographics, the housing stock, the, the housing market, um, but also uh, qualitative information that comes through sometimes in, in the data that uh, we at Turner Drake work with, which is more the sort of desktop stats Canada stuff, uh, but certainly uh, a lot mostly through the, the uh, public engagement side of, of the project. Uh, and it's not just a, a data collection and analysis exercise. I mean, that that is sort of the, the principal activity, but we're not just kind of taking data sets and, com and collating them and just kind of presenting them as a centralized resource. Uh, a lot of the value that comes out of this work is from combining those data sets, uh, looking at cross comparisons between different metrics to really try to drill down into what's happening in the housing market, what, or the housing uh, uh, inventory, uh, why certain challenges are, hap are, are uh, cropping up, so what are the dynamics uh, driving those. So, you know, if we just looked at the economy, for example, we would report on things like what's the overall unemployment rate or, you know, here's the sort of distribution of employment between different industries. That gets you so far, but you really can't identify uh, specific needs through that very well. What really uh, drives a lot of the value of this work is connecting it uh, to some of the other data sets. So to use that example again, looking at how employment in different industries is correlated with different housing tenures for the employees that, that work there. So we can see, for example, if there's a lot of rental tenured households concentrated in uh, retail or food service industries, for example, that tend to be lower uh, paying industries, if those, uh, if we're also connecting that with a challenge in housing conditions for the rental market, that points to maybe uh, an issue of income that can't afford market rents versus market uh, rate uh, apartment construction itself being, you know, too uh, pricey. Um, another example is looking at, you know, uh, housing demographics, not just uh, the overall number of households, but how do housing conditions vary by things like uh, indigenous identity or or household structure. Uh, and the last thing is is lived experiences, and that's a, a very uh, key piece of this that I'll uh, talk a bit more on the next slide. So this work is important because it looks at housing sort of cohesively and and specifically. So we're looking at both uh, market and non-market housing, and be, and it's important to do that. Often I find that the focus in in kind of these sort of studies is okay, what do we need for non-market or or sort of capital A affordable housing. Um, and you need to take a holistic look at the entire housing ecosystem because the non-market and the market side of things do interact with each other. Uh, it, the engagement in that lived experience uh, information is really important for uh, contextualizing as well as humanizing that quantitative data. And really the power in that uh, that I find is, is you can have just people's narratives about their experiences or you can have just the core housing need statistics that separately, if, there, if you have skeptics or people that aren't really engaged in housing issues, they can, they can kind of dismiss those, right? Oh, so-and-so is, is having housing challenges. Well, that's not everyone, right? That's just these people and, and who knows the reasons behind that. Or, you know, there's 30% of our 
renter uh, population that are in core housing need? Well, what does that really mean, right? Or is, is it just that they're choosing more expensive apartments or, you know, it, it, you can kind of use the unknown to kind of dismiss that when you have the two put together that here are some very kind of gut wrenching stories about housing experiences and challenges and look at how much of the population that that is that is experiencing that it really uh, drives that point home. Uh, the engagement as well in that lived experience is very important for bringing forward voices that are lost in traditional data collection. So oftentimes we're dealing with issues of housing conditions uh, experienced by Indigenous uh, uh, households, um, you know, hidden homelessness, issues of that sort that because of their housing situation, they're often not well represented in things like the census, right? They don't have an address that they would receive the census form in the first place. And so it's an effort to kind of bring in some of those lost voices or lost perspectives. And finally, there, there's a lot of value in kind of doing a, a study or uh, undertaking an, an initiative that is focused solely on housing. Most communities, if you're going through a larger municipal planning process or, or something of that nature, obviously you'll, you're gonna touch on housing. Uh, housing is a big part of a lot of planning work, but it tends to get diluted amongst a lot of other topics that you're trying to bring together into a community plan and really uh, dilutes the importance of that conversation and, and the amount of attention and resources that can be put to, uh, to solving those challenges. Perfect, so I'm gonna take it from there. Um, just briefly going over some of the legislative requirements. I think that's something that makes BC interesting is a lot of places and a lot of communities have you know, undertaken their own housing needs assessment or housing needs report or, or housing strategy that involves a lot of this research, but um, BC's taken the extra step and actually legislated uh, within the um, Local Government Act, which is our version of the Municipalities Act or um, you know, whatever you're using in your province. Um, that, that all the local governments have to conduct a housing needs assessment uh, within three years of the legislation taking effect. So uh, the last round of funding went out the door, I think early this spring, and by the end of this year, all of the communities in British Columbia will uh, either have done their housing needs assessment or be uh, actively uh, flouting the legislation. So, and there are a few municipalities who've chosen to do that um, for, for one reason or another, there's like political circumstances that sometimes um, communities choose to do that stuff with. So uh, it's a part of BC's uh, Homes for BC, which is the NDP government's 30-point uh, plan for housing affordability in British Columbia. It was released in 2018 as part of their first uh, mandate. Uh, I don't know if you follow BC politics at all, but the first mandate for the British, for the NDP government was actually a coalition with the Green Party. And uh, after our most recent fall election, uh, they've got now a full majority. So a lot of the things that were uh, maybe tenuous or they were pulling back on in their first term, uh, we hope that a lot of the housing affordability stuff is going to be um, coming soon. That includes uh, more money for things like in their platform, market stabilization, um, tax fraud and loopholes, building and building new homes and preserving old homes. That's where a lot of the, the cash is going. Uh, work to improve security for renters and a big piece of these projects and lots of other projects is building partnerships for affordability. And one of the first things that happened was the funding commitment to housing needs assessments. And it was pretty substantial. Um, before this funding commitment, I think we have been doing this type of work admittedly with less um, direction and, and cer certainly with um, uh, certainly less in-depth versions of these, but we've been doing them for uh, substantially less money than, than what we're doing them for now. Um, this $5 million over three years, which was released, has been uh, very, very helpful for getting a much better product out the door to local governments. And as well, it has really reinforced to local governments that uh, reciprocal relationship between them and the province, right? There's no added responsibility without added resourcing. And, and this was a, a huge way to, to make sure that local governments actually undertook this work and keep it localized in context. Um, one of the big things that when we were consulting on this new program that we asked them to put in was, you know, Know, ensure that it is a local context. Don't just apply um, a, a top-down approach because what works for you in Vancouver and in Victoria and in Nanaimo, the larger centers, is not going to work in 80% uh, of British Columbia communities, which are basically under 15,000 people, and in about 60% of our communities are under 10,000 people. So it's it's a very rural and, and spread out province, and what works for the lower mainland does not work for the vast majority of communities across British Columbia. Next slide, Neil. 
Um, the legislation itself is pretty sparse. So the the actual pieces that go into the Local Government Act are, are, are you know, they don't say that much. They, they mandate the collection of uh, current and projected housing needs. Uh, they, they ask that local governments prepare and publish a housing needs report. So it has to be a public document, has to be passed uh, by council or, or read into the minutes at a council meeting and then posted publicly on uh, the, re the community's website uh, for the, the period that the study is valid for. And one of the big pieces that has uh, had sort of um, reverberating implications across from this legislation is that after the study has been done, um, councils and decision makers and planners must consider that most recently collected information when they're amending their OCPs, their official community plans, or any regional growth strategies. So what we found is that these housing needs assessments have become uh, foundational policy for communities. Um, they are the things that people refer to for uh, when they're making all kinds of decisions. And you know, OCP amendment, it is not that rare, especially in communities with lots of development pressure. So looking at a place like maybe Penticton, which has, you know, 30,000 people, um, they're doing quite an, a lot of uh, OCP uh, amendments as part of their just regular development process. And every time they do that, they need to consider uh, how the uh, proposed development um, coincides with um, their, their housing needs uh, report and is it supporting or is it uh, hitting uh, or providing units for a population that is uh, identified in these uh, reports. Next slide, Neil. Uh, as I said, it's required for all municipalities and electoral areas, which is sort of a unique wrinkle. Um, electoral areas are basically uh, there is so that we have municipalities and regional districts, which are sort of the, the regional collection of municipalities. And then all of the unincorporated areas around municipalities fall into electoral areas, which uh, planning authority for those is vested in the regional district. So uh, where you might have a regional district that has say six uh, municipalities, you also have, uh, I think in the case of the most recent, what we're doing 15 uh, electoral areas. So often the electoral areas outnumber the municipalities. Uh, they're also a little more complicated to do because there aren't those sort of concentrated population centers. There aren't those typical community hubs. And more often than not, the electoral areas are deeply connected with one of those municipalities. So there's been some interesting um, solutions we've come up with to, to do that that I think we'll talk about a bit later. Uh, as we said, they must be complete by April 2022, though the funding has now all been released and we expect uh, almost everyone to have it done by the end of this year. And the big piece is it is now a requirement. You have to do it again after five years and again after another five years. It's going to become something that every local government does regularly as part of their, their planning work. Um, <clears throat> we're recommending that folks uh, time their next one rather than wait five years, time it for when the 2021 census data is released. So you've got the most up-to-date information possible in your report and then get on the five-year cycle. Um, and the last piece that I'll touch on before letting Andrew talk a bit is um, looking at the way that funding was rolled out. Um, the Union of BC Municipalities is our sort of uh, local um, branch of the sort of FCM, that kind of uh, body. And uh, they were distributing the funding, but the funding program allowed for distribution of the funds to either individual communities or to regional projects as a collective. So the funding was scaled to the size of community, but allowed you to combine multiple pots of funding so if you have five communities all going together, you could combine those five pots of funding into one grant, which uh, has some really interesting um, ramifications that maybe we didn't expect. And I think we're also gonna get to that a bit later. So uh, next slide, please, Neil. All right, so Sandy was speaking to the fact that uh, within the Local Governments Act, there was uh, limited, I guess, amendments or additions to it. Uh, within those amendments, however, there were very specific requirements for the collection of data and what data required uh, was required to be reported. In, re in regards to collection, uh, municipalities, electoral areas, regional districts are required to uh, collect upwards of 60 distinct kinds of data that can uh, relate to current and anticipated population, uh, current and anticipated households, household characteristics, uh, household income, economic sectors and labor force, uh, housing characteristics, housing values, households and core housing need, uh, inclusive of the housing criteria within them, uh, within it being adequacy, affordability and suitability, and then finally, uh, current and anticipated housing units. 
those anticipated housing units uh, is kind of a, a conversation as to what a community can anticipate for demand. Uh, so is the growth uh, in households, uh, what uh, is that gonna mean in the future and whether the community itself can handle that uh, based off of uh, what is occurring now. Um, it's important to note that the upwards of 60 kinds of data, this is a minimum. Uh, so you do have the flexibility to look into other pieces that might be of interest. Uh, for instance, in the regional district of Central Kootenai, uh, we were asked to look into uh, energy poverty. Uh, furthermore, you can look into uh, short-term rentals, which in itself is part of those 60 pieces of data, but it isn't a rigid requirement. There's kind of a asterisk and if possible next to that piece, because sometimes that's just too difficult to find. Uh, additional activities as part of uh, the process itself are permitted, such as uh, staff capacity building. So as part of the projects, at least that we've been doing, uh, at the end, we have been presenting uh, certain tools, the processes, a uh, little bit of a primer to the regulation, so that in the future, every five years, these communities can uh, do this work internally. And then finally, as part of the collection process, um, it's important to note that although engagement is incredibly important, it is actually not a requirement. Um, and oftentimes you'll find um, that engagement can be quite a substantial undertaking. And so the government uh, with their minimum requirements has created a little bit more of a wiggle room so that um, these communities can work on these every five years without having to extend themselves because they might not have that capacity to do so. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the government does do or uh, provide some sort of, uh, or some ways to make work a little easier uh, for consultants as, as well for uh, the communities who are doing it internally right now. Uh, most of the data sources are provided through the BC Statistics website, uh, so they're all aggregated together, whether they are spreadsheets or links to uh, other websites where you can find the information. So data included in this uh, is BC assessment, so assessments, um, sale prices and sales volumes, BC housing for non-market housing inventories, CMHC, uh, local governments, um, and finally Statistics Canada censuses. What is unique about the BC work is that they have actually uh, purchased custom data sets from Statistics Canada for 2006, 2011, and 2016, which breaks out uh, many different variables by tenureship. So you can have different household types, uh, different dwelling types based off of whether a household rents or owns, which is um, incredibly helpful for kind of finding those nuances. Next slide, please. And as you're going through this process, you start to establish a certain kind of expectation of what is going to occur and mo most of which actually does occur. Um, by the end of it, you expect to have this aggregation of multiple resources. Uh, in many ways, these documents do become references uh, for later work. Uh, there's an expectation that the work to be done is a point in time assessment of a local uh, or uh, a community's housing conditions, uh, specifically so that in five years time or whatever amount of time uh, that passes, a community can uh, look at how they have evolved uh, over that period. There's an expectation that, or actually it's not an expectation, it's a requirement actually to inform other municipal and community policy and strategies. And most importantly, uh, the expectation is that it's going to identify data and information gaps. And this is largest in the rural communities where the amount of data is limited. Uh, but what happens, especially through engagement practices, is that you're able to actually either fill those gaps or uh, find out where they are so that in fewer, further iterations, you can find uh, innovative ways to address that. And then lastly, and I've, I've touched on this before, is that um, there's an expectation that after this first round of funding, when they when governments do their next uh, housing needs assessments, that they will be able to do it internally. Next slide. 
So we all know that, you know, the expectations of a funding program and what that funding program actually look like in practice can vary wildly. And it's no different in this, the case of this uh, housing needs assessments legislation. Um, we have found on the ground doing the work that uh, while the requirements say many things and while there are very specific baseline expectations that local governments must meet, the actual practice of implementing these housing needs assessments has been very different and much more uh, touchy-feely than it is sort of data-based. So, uh, especially in smaller communities, you know, across BC, lots of communities already have an understanding of their housing needs, already have, um, you know, some base level housing needs assessment in place. Uh, but for the ones that don't, most of which are rural communities, this is representing the starting point for their conversations about housing. They're seeing things trickle in, decision makers are hearing things from their constituents, and they're not really having an answer for what to do or even uh, knowing where to start. So these documents are becoming that starting place, not only in terms of data collection, but are in terms of partnership development. So working with local nonprofits in their communities, local, working with other regional and local stakeholders, uh, as well as developing additional policy. We include at the end of our documents, a um, sort of policy tools guide, which is just a broad list of the different policy tools available to local governments in BC. And you know, a couple of best practices that folks might be interested in. So it's becoming really the first place where um, people are starting to uh, identify need and then uh, begin to address it. And we're also finding that that <clears throat> sort of interest from the local government has started galvanizing nonprofit communities. Um, these are folks who have been working largely uh, without um, sort of, in, in some communities, obviously, there's really good relationships between nonprofits and uh, local uh, governments, but in others, they're sort of working in very separate silos. And these projects have, have really brought them together, especially as the, the main way of um, sort of contributing non-market units to uh, communities in BC is through the nonprofit sector. It's also reinforced regional collaboration because of that regional funding. Uh, option, uh, we found that local governments are looking around and seeing that, you know, 40 minutes away, the, the community down the road is, is having the exact same issues or um, looking and realizing that in this valley, if we kept ourselves as one, we can get far more robust data collection and analysis. But if we do it on our own, we've only got a thousand people and the census isn't going to be that useful for us. Uh, it's also been really interesting to push some of the boundaries of the data. We have come up against a lot of the uh, limitations of that custom data set that the BC government purchased. And we've been actually looking at purchasing our own custom data sets to supplement data. Uh, a big piece is looking at uh, Indigenous community members who are not well represented in census data. Um, there are a few places where you can go to find some additional um, Census Canada data on those things that we've actually been able to purchase a custom set. And then the last couple things is, you know, this document has become an advocacy and communications tool. So working, uh, not only advocating to your public for the good of nonprofit or non-market housing or affordable housing in general, and being able to communicate the need in the, across communities to folks who might not otherwise see it, but also upwards. So from the local government or regional level up to the province where the majority of this funding comes. Uh, it's been a way for uh, regional collaboratives, for uh, broader than regional collaboratives to, to combine their findings and say, look, like this is what we've seen in our communities. And uh, it's not the responsibility of local governments to be solving this alone. So we need to uh, work together to increase funding for these sorts of uh, local interventions. And um, there's a recognition that the local level is where uh, housing policy needs to manifest because it's where the need is the most acute. So really, they've become far more than just a report, right? This is, it's become a, a community development exercise in a lot of ways. And uh, it's been really uh, frustrating at times to navigate that uh, with the strictures coming down from the province, but also really rewarding to see that, um, that spark start to happen in a lot of smaller communities. Next slide, Neil. So we'll just run you through a couple key findings that we've seen across most of the communities that we have been working in. Um, I guess, disclaimer, a lot of these things aren't new to most planners. Uh, these are things that we're seeing across uh, most jurisdictions in some way, shape or form. What's important to consider though is that every community is impacted differently and uh, at, I guess, greater magnitudes. Um, so next slide. So first off, 
uh, something that we see all the time, particularly here in Atlantic Canada, is that communities are aging uh, and they are aging quickly. So the proportion of seniors in the population has increased relatively dramatically um, in 2016 since 2006. And there is this anticipation that this will continue uh, onwards and at least in this chart below up until uh, 2026. With these aging populations, you have um, shifting family structures. So as uh, more seniors uh, make part of the population, smaller households from either children moving out or um, unfortunately the loss of a lo loved one, um, which translates to a decline in household size, which we see many times that these communities once again, particularly rural or more so rural, uh, that have gradual uh, decline in population because the household sizes have uh, decreased significantly enough, there's actually an increase in the amount of households, which in turn means that there's an increase in demand for households. So it's not as simple as looking at the population, oh, it's, it's going down, so therefore we might not need as many homes, but the shift in the family structures is actually meaning that communities might still need to build or provide some sort of alternative for these individuals or these um, families. Next slide. Another thing that we're seeing, and this is more recently here, uh, at least in Nova Scotia, is that housing costs are rising. And I'm not they're not only rising by kind of the anticipated inflation, but they're rising uh, much higher than that. This graphic below comes from the city of Terrace uh, in Northern BC. And what we're seeing adjusted for inflation is that the single detached homes in 2010, um, or at least in 2019, are 46% more expensive after inflation than they were in 2010. And if you look at a row house, it's 84%. So there's obviously some different nuances per community some might grow more gra gradually um, nevertheless what we're seeing is that um, with the increase in uh, dwelling prices there's oftentimes not a matching increase in wages or salaries so you see that these markets are becoming harder to enter for low to middle income earners and single income households next slide uh, what we actually found was interesting because this is this wasn't specific to urban but also to the rural setting was that renting was becoming more popular uh, there's more individuals and families who are choosing to rent and this is whether by choice or due to market forces uh, engagement results seem to indicate the latter uh, with many um, noting that it's it's just too expensive for them to find a home or to move out of the living situation that they are in currently so generally across the board uh, renters as often single um, income households are less able to meet their housing needs. Uh, to illustrate this, in 2016, uh, the prevalence of core housing need for a renter household, uh, and this is in the uh, regional district of Central Kootenai, was 34%, whereas the uh, prevalence of core housing need for owner households was 10%. Uh, if you look at the graphic, there's, um, interestingly, and this follows on the kind of more families, uh, quote unquote, choosing to rent, the increase between 2006 and 2016 in the uh, percentage of renters by age cohort, uh, those who are zero to 19 years old, there has been a substantial enough increase in those two years or between those two years, which corresponds directly to uh, the increase that has occurred for those 35 to 49. So because they uh, belong to those families who are renting uh, or are renting more. Uh, another interesting thing is, it, and this is what we're seeing kind of across the board, is uh, if you look at the age cohorts that are 75 plus, uh, they were renting more in 2006. Nowadays, uh, either they are choosing to remain in their homes, they want to age in place, or uh, there's just not that availability for them to move out of the homes that they own or to. Uh, downsize or find an alternative. Uh, next slide. Um, clearly what you find out of the data pretty much off, um, off the bat is that there are disproportionate impacts across different uh, populations or household types. For instance, couples who are often dual income are most likely to meet their housing needs, whereas lone parents and uh, singles, often seniors, are struggling to do so. 
where data is available, and Sandy uh, mentioned purchasing some custom data sets, uh, Indigenous community members report higher rates of core housing need, and just generally uh, across whether it is um, certain populations or certain household types, renters of these or those that rent in each of these categories are uh, always or most often um, experiencing higher rates of core housing need or other uh, types of hardship. The graphic below, uh, this was for the city of Terrace again, uh, who uh, have uh, about 25% of their population as uh, Indigenous or identifying as Indigenous. So in core housing need, um, the non-Indigenous population had a prevalence of about 9%, whereas the Indigenous population uh, more than doubled to 23%. Next slide. So Andrew's done a bit of the sort of quantitative findings looking at the data and I'll, I'll touch a bit on what we found in the qualitative data so through our engagement. Uh, when we develop these these like processes and, and, and build out our plan for a project like this, typically we would allocate about a third of our resources to data collection and analysis, about a third of our resources to um, community engagement, and then a final third to sort of report production, project management and expenses, et cetera. So we, we really do value uh, engagement and data analysis uh, very similar Similarly, in terms of time, energy, and expense that we put into them. So we've gotten a ton of great um, uh, data coming from community members for, for all of these studies. Um, and what we found across the board is that the survey data that we're collecting and that the key informant interviews and, and all of the different ways that we're gathering public data are showing a more dire housing situation than um, some of our traditional data sets. Uh, a, a core housing need rate of 33% amongst renters is, is high and is obviously concerning, but it really hits home when you look at your survey and you see that all of all your survey respondents, 40% indicated that their current housing uh, was unaffordable. Or if, if you see that just in the renters, about 63%. And that's the same uh, place where we got data from for that uh, increasing renter uh, project, that regional district of Central Kootenai. And there's some uh, great quotes, uh, or maybe this, I can't remember, but there's some great quotes here as well. Just the, a number of quotes that we got about people who were expressing frustration and concern and really being scared that they're, even though maybe their current situation is affordable, it's not sustainable. Uh, they're not saving the money that they need to save. They're not able to um, provide other expenses or other costs or other you know items for their families because they're paying so much more to rent there's a lot of people who are you know maybe not represented in a core housing needs strat uh, stat but are feeling like they're on the razor's edge of affordability and housing is a huge reason for that so um, a lot of quotes along the lines of these ones here saying that you know rent is unaffordable to even those that are making good money with a good career people are putting so much money to afford rent that they don't have enough money to save to purchase a house and invest in their future. So a lot of people not seeing a future for them in their community because of the housing situation. Um, someone talking about how their mom moved to their community and had to move back because she couldn't find a cheap enough place. And then, you know, a lot of quotes from people just saying the price of homes is not sustainable anymore. Uh, if you don't make 75 or $100,000 a year, which is above the median income in this community, well above, um, you're, you're not able to, to create a sustainable life for yourself. So, uh, yeah, definitely a little, uh, the data is, the data is pretty sterile, even when it is saying something pretty dramatic, it, it is coming across as pretty sterile and combining it with this uh, qu qualitative feedback has been really effective in terms of getting the message to decision makers that there are people in your communities that are really struggling to meet their needs. Next slide, please, Neil. So one of the really key findings that we've come from here is that <clears throat> the spectrum that is served by market housing is becoming smaller and smaller. So in one jurisdiction, this is in, um, this data comes from the regional district of Central Kootenai and is really representative of what we're seeing across the province in many of these smaller communities. Uh, the city of Nelson has about 10,000 people and it is the service hub for the broader regional district. Um, their local nonprofit maintains a wait list. So in a community of 10,000 people, plus you know the surrounding area, their local nonprofit maintains a, a community wait list of 143 plus units for subsidized non-market housing. And in the last pit count point in time count in 2018, there were 101 people experiencing homelessness, 72% of whom were unhoused. And that number is, is largely underrepresents the number of people who are actually experiencing homelessness in those communities because of the number of people who are in that 
hidden homelessness um, situation. Anecdotally from places like people who work at the food bank, from other uh, key informants and, and you know, service agencies, we heard that the number of people living in RVs or couch surfing uh, or staying with family and friends have gone up. And then in the surveys, we had a ton of respondents reporting unsafe or unsanitary housing conditions, poor housing conditions, lots of people talking about how their houses are cold and that when the wind blows, you can really feel that your windows are single pane and they're not sealed properly. Um, and the number of people reporting just a general increase in stress and worry related to housing insecurity was was really stunning. So I'll, I'll sort of leave these quotes up on the screen, but uh, one person here on the bottom quote is saying that they work full-time plus part-time to make ends meet. And even though they have a good education, they um, are still living in their car or having to live in a place that has mold and a leaky roof. Uh, and just saying that they don't want to have to choose between food and heat. So um, it is absolutely, the market is becoming less and less able to meet the needs of these communities. And it reinforces the need for more of that non-market housing often provisioned by uh, nonprofit organizations. Next slide. So we're just going to be going kind of quickly through a couple of lessons that we learned throughout the process in BC, uh, as well as a couple of the gaps that we uh, noticed uh, as part of that process. Um, so Neil, if you can go to the next slide, we'll just begin with, uh, at least from my side, the data sources. Um, it, it's great that the province is able to combine or collect all the information, um, which is about two thirds of what you require for reporting on housing needs, uh, at least based off of that 60 data points that I was referring to before. And so it's all collected in one space. Um, nevertheless, it's important to note that all sources aren't created equal. Uh, they do have different reference appearances. The amount of detail in each of them is different. Uh, whether the data is actually available for your jurisdiction um, may differ. And just generally, there's a difference in user friendliness. We are all, for the most part, uh, comfortable enough in going through the Statistics Canada website, but there are uh, some documents that um, are definitely intended for a certain user, and so they are quite um, difficult to navigate and are just generally unfamiliar uh, for most people who are looking at it. And Specifically, this is, comes with a lot of the, or this is referring, at least in our experience, uh, assessment information. So traditional data um, works well for overall trends, but uh, it doesn't necessarily provide the most compelling um, narrative. And, and this is, and we'll talk about it a little further, or Sandy will talk about it, is where the engagement portion comes in. Uh, I spoke a little bit about the reporting. Uh, I do not believe I covered uh, the actual reporting requirements. I spoke specifically only about the collection requirements. For reporting, there it's much um, more limited in regards to what you are supposed to speak to. Uh, for instance, for reporting, uh, you need to talk to core housing need, extreme core housing need, the amount of uh, units demanded, and uh, the anticipated uh, or anticipated population uh, over the next five years. So that's only about like four um, data points. And then you need to speak to specific uh, topics such as affordable housing, subsidized housing, uh, homelessness, seniors housing. So at the end of the day, the government is really trying to understand very um, limited pieces of information, which is good because this minimum expectation means that in future iterations of the project, there's not as much um, expectations for governments to go through um, such a large process as they might be doing for the first time around with the funding that's available. The um, implications, or I guess the quote unquote bad side of it is that this imposed rigidity, particularly if limited by a budget, um, does tend to create a document that's more just of a reference document. It's something that you look at, you look at the table of contents, you find that piece of data and, okay, cool. Um, but that doesn't necessarily meet the need of a lot of stakeholders. There's not that narrative that's, uh, or that humanizing aspect to it that, that's really driving the point home as to, okay, this is the housing condition that my community is facing. Next slide. Um, and very briefly, in order to I kind of convey a lot of pages into only a couple, we do sometimes provide, or we always provide um, a couple page summaries in regards to different trends. So whether it's about uh, family structures or households uh, and incomes, 
Um, so this is an example of one of those. The next slide uh, is also another example that you would find that speaks to the affordability and um, housing prices and availability. So not much to speak to here, but just generally, it, it is an important tool uh, to be able to convey uh, at least effectively a large document for the most part reaches about 50 pages long and maybe one to four uh, pages. Next slide. A big lesson that we learned from this is that oftentimes seeing a project from the regional focus is um, quite, I guess, it, it, there is a large benefit to it. So for instance, from a financial point of view, at least from the grant side, uh, communities that pool their money together can obviously receive much more. The city of Nelson, as Sandy mentioned, uh, about 10,000 people. Uh, them alone, if they want to create um, or go through the housing needs process, they could receive upwards of $20,000, whereas the regional district of Central Kootenai altogether could receive $150,000. Um, it's important to note though, the regional district of Central Kootenai is 19 different communities. Nevertheless, doing the reports for several, there are efficiencies that can be had. Um, that said, you do require broader uh, data collection. Uh, you are required to be more innovative in your analysis. There's more travel time required, more printing costs, and just generally uh, it takes more time to do. But the importance is that uh, housing doesn't respect municipal boundaries. So oftentimes these trends that you see in the city of Nelson, they are going to impact what's occurring in the adjacent electoral areas. It's not confined to its boundary alone. So markets themselves are regional. Um, and oftentimes ways that at least we found to, to interpret this is to create these sub-regions within the regional district that can take uh, multiple communities, whether it's a uh, primary market and some uh, surrounding electoral areas and speaking to that as a whole rather than just individuals. Uh, across the board though, uh, Although it, regional focus is uh, generally of a benefit, it is incredibly challenging to be everything to everyone. There's differing expectations um, and different uh, data availability that creates a little bit of a balancing act in how you approach uh, the final uh, deliverable. Perfect. Yeah, and some of the key lessons that we learned about engagement are that it is absolutely necessary. You can't do one without the other uh, in order to paint an accurate portrait of, of housing in your community. Community engagement absolutely has to be part of it and it has to be uh, dedicated community engagement designed to reach out to very specific stakeholder groups and to collect lived experience. One of the best ways of doing this is making a relationship with your nonprofit service community early and uh, keeping that relationship alive by going back to them often and giving as much as you get. So you have to be giving them a product uh, while you're asking them to maybe use your survey as part of their um, intake uh, form or something like that, right? So uh, routinely what we do is we do some very base level analysis of the data and we bring that to the nonprofits as a sort of uh, opening, um, like here's what we found so far, does this match your expectations? If it doesn't, why not? And feel free to use this data as you apply for your uh, next round of provincial funding for a housing development or, or something like that. Um, a really important thing too is that we're doing this now all with 2016 census data. There are some ways to get some updated information through things like assessment data that happens annually, but more often than not, the most important pieces are from 2016. And when people look at your report and they see 2016, a lot of them immediately dismiss it as being inaccurate, especially in smaller communities where things have changed quickly. We uh, did this study in a community that had a timber strike for eight months right before we went in and did the analysis. And so anything that happened a year ago does not matter because a third of the community has been out of work or on strike for eight months, right? So it, it, really important to combine engagement because it is the most up-to-date and the most accurate reflection of, of that lived experience. And it's always the most compelling. It's the thing that decision makers look at and they can immediately connect with and immediately see that experience represented in their communities. So uh, it's really about um, definitely about collecting the data and also about building those partnerships, uh, which can have impacts down the line as you move towards addressing these needs rather than just cataloging them. Next slide, Dan. Uh, the capacity building one was something we argued for when they were developing the uh, funding program. We uh, argued that it be uh, allowed as a use for the funds under the grant stipulations, and we were really lucky that that was something that they included. 
Um, usually what we do is some really basic staff training on the requirements, the collection methodologies, and how we did our engagement. And we've also been including a tool that should help with future assessments. So it's a, a way of combining all of the data that we currently have into an Excel sheet and making it easy to add new data and then auto-generate new graphs. It's kind of a, a really base level, like computer program kind of thing that they can use. Uh, I mean, there's no guarantee that there's going to be funding in five years for the next round. So a lot of these smaller municipalities may not have the ability to go out and hire a consultant. They might have to be doing them internally. Um, so we're trying to simplify this process as much as possible, but also, you know, really push the importance of uh, having this be like an active process, right? Monitoring your housing needs, you can do it every year. Here are the 10 indicators that are released annually. Here are the 25 that are released through the census. You know, which ones can you build into your um, your ongoing routine. Maybe once a month you go take a look at your local rental sites and you start cataloging your secondary rental market. Um, things like that as, as ways to, to monitor these on an ongoing basis and build that capacity within um, local staffs. Next slide, Neil. Um, I think the last couple of challenges here are um, just looking at, you know, a few of the minor things. Managing expectations is really challenging, especially for communities who maybe don't understand what you're there and what you can do through this study. There are limitations to what we can actually accomplish, uh, and we're not going to solve your housing problems. Um, communicating the limitations of the data uh, so people can understand that that 2016 data, though it is from 2016, is not useless. It is there to serve a function and can give you an, a picture of trends. Uh, building local trust, addressing the unique needs of communities, managing those regional relationships. Uh, sometimes we sort of drop into a community and don't understand that they have like rival hockey teams and hate each other and we now need to, you know, go ahead and remind them that they're actually pretty similar in the long haul. Uh, and even though one is the hospital and the other one has the pool, you know, you know, reminding them that they're not the same community, but really they are resource wise and housing wise, very similar. Uh, and then lastly, it's been really challenging to do all of this through COVID-19, especially in rural communities where um, there is, we would really love to be there and, and actually do the engagement in person. So I think I'll let Neil uh, finish off our presentation for us and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, and so just to to bring all of that presentation, our experience back to Atlanta, Canada, at least obviously uh, Andrew and I are, are based here in Halifax, and this is where we do most of our consulting work in general. Um, I think, you know, from the East Coast, there's oftentimes this perception of like Toronto is a vastly different beast than anything we have here. Vancouver is vastly different than anything we have here. Ergo, Ontario is nothing like Atlanta, Canada. British Columbia is nothing like Atlanta, Canada. And Sandy already touched on the, this uh, fact that, you know, we, we haven't done any work in Vancouver or the Lower Mainland. We've been doing, you know, Vancouver Island, the interior. These communities are very, very similar to what we have seen through our work here all over Atlanta, Canada, aging populations, uh, economic conditions, housing challenges, some of the d even recent dynamics of, outside sources of demand affecting local housing markets in ways that the local economy can't really adjust to. So it's uh, a lot of this work is really, you know, it's directly applicable to the challenges and the situations that, that we have here. And, and I think, you know, municipalities or communities in Atlantic Canada that have done this type of work uh, probably recognize that. Um, we see very similar sort of rural and uh, regional divides or rural and urban divides where there is still maybe uniform uh, housing uh, presence of housing challenges, but the challenges themselves are of a different nature. And those divides are very similar to what we have here where it's maybe, uh, you know, a lack of non-market uh, housing and uh, in, in rural areas and uh, maybe like a, a, an income issue in higher priced urban areas uh, for those lower income uh, occupations and industries. Uh, also very similar housing pressures. A lot of these communities, like a lot of Atlantic Canadian communities, have had fairly sleepy housing markets and housing uh, costs across the ecosystem. And only in the last few years, because of heating up uh, conditions in, say, Vancouver, leading to people you know, kind of cashing out there, spending half of what they sold their house for in Vancouver, building or buying a new house in Nelson. But that half is still twice what the local housing uh, prices in Nelson are. You know, we're, we're seeing that uh, certainly in 2020 in Atlanta, Canada, with some of the exodus from other provinces, but that's been a dynamic that's been going on for a couple of years here as well. Uh, and there's certainly a potential for these housing needs assessments to become uh, a similar starting place for local government. So there have been 
local governments that have undertaken this, uh, you know, a lot recently. Um, but there's definitely still, I think, the need uh, or the lack of that understanding that exists here is sort of where BC was a couple of years ago before a lot of this uh, program was put in place. And so there's a, a very good potential here for this type of work to help initiate, drive those conversations, uh, increase the awareness kind of geographically outside of just the communities that have been already proactive on the issue. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, housing needs assessments, housing, as I said at the beginning, kind of is the bottom line that a lot of other factors and challenges sort of fall down to, right? Uh, so talking about uh, starting a conversation just about housing, looking at housing as a topic in and of itself, is also a really good opportunity uh, to start introducing uh, topics or conversations that maybe uh, you know staff or, or, or people in local government have been wanting to introduce in their communities, but having trouble kind of finding that uptake. Uh, so you know, talking about equity issues, talking about uh, income inequality, and and uh, the role of uh, the public sector in in sort of supporting society. A lot of that can kind of be baked into the undertaking of a housing needs assessment. So uh, Sandy put this this phrase here at the bottom that, you know, you can kind of use these as a, as a bit of a Trojan horse to uh, introduce some conversations that without that common context of housing, because everyone needs housing, it might be hard to get people on board or get ears open for the first time. So I thought we'd finish off with uh, sort of the same slide that we finish off a lot of our presentations to clients when we're, we're wrapping up a housing needs project, which is sort of what, what is the end point of a housing needs assessment? Where do you go from here? Oftentimes, especially if it's a community where they haven't really been very proactive or engaged in housing topics, there's this impression of like, okay, the housing needs assessment is going to uh, tell us what we need, need to do to solve all these problems. And that's that's absolutely not what happens. We can kind of point to certain directions through that type of project, but really what we're trying to do is show what have been the past and what are the current conditions, what are the challenges that you need to grapple with. So what's happening, who is it happening to? Determining how you address those is really the next step after a housing needs assessment. So uh, you generally at local government level, you look at uh, sort of five approaches, regulation, incentivization, partnership, education, and advocacy as the sort of channels or the strat strategic directions you can take uh, in addressing housing challenges, but that it comes after and is informed by the findings of the housing needs assessment. So that, that kind of flows through to the next steps, which are either kind of developing some kind of program or, or supports or resources just out of uh, the understanding from the housing needs assessment or quite often going into that next step of, okay, now we need to develop our strategy to really kind of take these pieces that the needs assessment identifies, pull them together, match them with the actions, whether it's sort of high level strategy or very on the ground tactical kind of things you can do to, to get to that next step of from what is going on to what do we do about it. Uh, generally, what we've found, and I expect this is uh, very similar across Atlantic Canada, is when you get into these communities, uh, if it doesn't already exist, it very quickly comes together that uh, you build a broad consensus and a willingness to act. So, uh, you know, oftentimes the non-profit or NGO sector has kind of already gotten a head start on that. Uh, but if they are all in a certain degree kind of acting in isolation, this, uh, this process brings them together and kind of builds some of that momentum, which is really helpful. Uh, and the last thing to really take away is, and why is the, the provincial requirement in BC for this five-year iterative uh, process is really great, is because housing issues are, are basically chronic. Um, we had a client who used this really great analogy that uh, you know dealing with housing challenges is, a, is like shoveling snow, right? It doesn't matter how much money you spent on your snow clearing budget last year, or last winter, this winter is going to come around, it's going to snow again, and you've got to stay on top of it. And housing is very much the same. A lot of the challenges that we're experiencing now is because we stopped shoveling the snow in the 1990s. And so it's not that you need a document that tells you here's the number of units you need to build and here's the exact people you need to put in them to solve the problem. It's here are the processes or the systems you need to put in place to manage and minimize and hopefully uh, contain those issues over time. Like if you solve them once and then give up, you're probably going to see them come back. 
So with that, uh, we're basically right on time uh, for the, the posted uh, time period for the webinar, but I'm happy to stick around if other folks are to, to take questions or kind of uh, discuss things further. Uh, I've got uh, my contact information there as well as Sandy. So if you do have uh, further questions and want to pick our brains a bit, uh, feel free to, to reach out to either of us. Um, I'll turn it back over to Susan, at, I guess, at this point. Okay. Thank you very much for yeah. your attention. Thank you so much, Neil, Andrew, and Sandy. That was fantastic, and that was a lot of really wonderful information. I do see that we're, we're starting to lose participants. So in the interest of time, what we'll do is, as you mentioned, um, those who would like to stick around, we'll do uh, maybe one question here. Um, and then what we'll just say is uh, that the presentation, both the recording and the presentation itself, will be available on the API website. So if you'd like to follow up with Neil, Andrew, or Sandy, please do so um, with, with your questions and comments. Um, so just uh, maybe the, the one question that I want to maybe just highlight here is, um, will information that from the presentation um, in terms of, you know, the assessments themselves, reports, documents, will they be available to public for those who kind of want to follow in your footsteps here? What resources are available to them? Sure, yeah, well, for the work that we've done specifically, we've got four of these now completed or almost complete. Uh, the Comox Valley Regional District, the Regional District of Central Kootenai, uh, the Greater Ter City of, uh, or City of Terrace, Greater Terrace area, and the one that we're just wrapping up now, which is the Thompson Nicola Regional District. Uh, it's a requirement to post these publicly. Uh, three of those, the, the exception being Thompson Nicola, because it's just wrapping up, those are already on the, those municipalities' websites. So you can, if you want to see our work, you can just Google know regional district central Kootenai housing needs assessment you can find it very easily they're not just kind of hidden away in your municipal documents uh, you know do, uh, uh, drive uh, they have their own dedicated web pages with a lot of the various kind of sub regional reports all all laid out there um, but if you want to look at uh, at the provincial level there is also a similarly a, a dedicated uh, website uh, that the province maintains about how uh, sort of from their perspective they've laid out this this process so it, it should be easy to find search bc housing needs assessments and you'll come up with a lot not just ours okay fantastic thank you so we should bring things to a close but i just want to say a huge thank you you touched on a lot of information from rural versus, versus urban to um, the fact that having a regional focus and recognizing the similarities between communities is really valuable and also recognizing that often rural communities, those electoral areas or LSDs here in New Brunswick, um, they're really connected to the urban centers. So um, kind of recognizing that that regional focus is very important. It was fascinating to hear you talk about qualitative versus quantitative data and, you know, the importance of public engagement as well as, you know, for example, Stats Canada data. Um, you need both that human side as well as those, those hard numbers. And the, and the fact that you're, you know, everybody needs housing, but we're all very different. So um, renters, homeowners, affordable housing, subsidized housing, um, the homeless to different age groups, different indigenous groups, um, really breaking down who it is that needs housing and how best to, to target those groups. That was really fascinating. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so Neil, Andrew and Sandy, fantastic presentation. I just want to acknowledge Dylan with the Atlantic Planners Institute who did our technical support today. Um, things went off without a glitch. So thank you very much. And, and thank you to all of you who joined us today. Um, time is a precious commodity and um, we appreciate everyone coming together today. So all the best for now and um, watch for the presentation and slides to be posted on the APA web, API pardon, website. And, uh, We'll let you go for now. So have a wonderful day and thank you again. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks all.